All right, so let's go through the solution of the exam so that you all have an idea of what's going on with it. Okay, so problem number one, explain why cracks in a reinforced concrete beam form at a 45 degree angle, more circle. Remember, you have a section that's subjected to pure shear. Its principal stresses occur 45 degrees uh, rotation. That's why you get cracks at a 45 degree angle. <coughs> this one baffled me how many bars would be considered when computing AV for the cross section. I mean, a lot of people, like I got five. Um, uh, I, most people who got it wrong put two. No, it's four. You know, four bars cross a crack. <coughs> All right, number three. When computing deflections in a reinforced concrete beam, how do engineers account for a portion of the beam's bending moment exceeding M, uh, uh, the cracking moment? Some of the beam is cracked, some of it isn't. So how do you account for that? You use an effective moment of inertia. That's what I was looking for. If you, if you just put IE, you got it correct. <coughs> All right, number four. Um, you could have put anything really that kind of um, uh, related to this, some people put stage construction, people put more beam, more cracking, or more load, more cracking. The idea is that the more load you apply, the more cracking that you get, so you get a lower moment of inertia. Um, <coughs> because of that, you have to track the load progression throughout the beam. More load equals lower moment of inertia. So anything to that effect, you got full credit. Now this one, this one uh, uh, might have been a little harsh on, but I mean, it, there's actually a pretty simple answer. When computing long-term deflections, how do engineers decide what percentage of live load is sustained? That's not the time-dependent factor. That's 20% of the load is sustained, 30% of the load is sustained. How do you determine that? Use your judgment, okay? That, that, is, that is it. There is no hard and fast rule, okay? That's number one. Now, number two, <coughs> this one, I'll admit I was a little shocked by how many people just didn't draw the shear diagram, like, like at all. Um, there were a lot of people who just didn't draw it, okay? Now, <coughs> let's get into the problem though. One of the biggest mistakes was this right here. Re uh, reinforced concrete beam is used to support the service loads. What do service loads mean? It's no load factors. So this was a live load, it needed to be bumped up. This was a dead load, it needed to be bumped up. No load factors, okay? <coughs> now, once you factor your loads, you can compute your reactions and do your shear diagram. I think this was a pretty easy problem. I gave a problem similar to this last year, and the beam that I gave them was more complicated. So uh, I, I was kind of surprised on this one. <coughs> so, Looking at your shear diagram, what is the maximum shear in the center portion of the beam? 16 kips, okay? So, look at this. Here's problem two. The maximum shear in the center region is 16 kips. Stirrups are not required where the shear is less than or equal to half a PVC. So compute half a PVC, all right? Two lambda BWD square root of FC prime. I'm still getting people putting in five. No, you put in PSI, you get out PSI, okay? So <coughs> go through, VC is about 54.3 kips, PVC is about 40.7, half of PVC is 20.365. So here you go, 16 kips in load, half of PVC is 20.3, no stirrups. And that was it. That's number two. Number three. I'll be honest, I actually gave number three, like, this is the exact same problem as last year, just different numbers. Um, <coughs> um, let's, let's just go through the math. Um, okay. Oh, goodness. All right. So number three, uh, concrete capacity, calculate the shear capacity of the concrete. Same deal. PVC comes out to be 17.7 .7 kips for the stirrups. FY is 60 KSI. The area of a number three bar is 0.11. The area of number three U-shaped stirrups is 0.22. Two number threes, okay? <coughs> Got a constant shear of 40 kips. Literally, plug and chug. Now, a lot of you were drawing like the shear diagram and trying to identify the regions, but I think, I think what the big problem with, with this question 
was a lot of you were too married into the literal procedure that we did on that one example in class and not sort of taking a step back and going, wait, here's what he's asking, you know? So, so yeah. <laughs> now, number four. Um, let me go up here a little bit. Um, one of the big things um, was what, I mean, and I tried to be as gentle as I could be, but like this right here, for your calculations, take I crack to be 12,000 uh, inches to the fourth. I still had people computing it, you know? I mean, it was there, you know? So I think a lot of people, like they said, that there was a time issue, but a lot of people who said that also spent time doing this when they didn't need to. So, <laughs> and that took a lot of time, okay? So I went ahead here and I've just got some unit conversions, which that's another thing. A lot of, there was a lot of units issues on this problem, you know? A lot of, a lot of units issues. Um, when you write out your units, guarantee you have a better chance of getting the right answer, okay? <coughs> so, let's get into it. So, problem number four. Okay, so the gross moment of inertia, cracked moment of inertia you were given. Now, this is a big point right here. I want to make this point. This is your gross moment of inertia. This is your cracked moment of inertia. Your effective moment of inertia, i.e., when you compute that, has got to be between those values. I mean, I was getting like 420 million inches to the fourth on, on some, of, some of the IEs. That has, like, that had to have been a sign that something's wrong, you know. Your cracked moment of inertia has to be between these two values, okay. Uh, y sub t, h over 2, I mean, it's 13.5 inches, uh, 7.5 square root of 4,500 psi. Plug and chug, you should have got a crack moment of around 61 foot kips. <coughs> All right. Now, the two load cases you needed to handle were dead load and then dead plus live load. I still had folks trying to do the dead load deflection and then the live load deflection or using the dead plus live moment of inertia for the dead loads. Now, you just treat them all separate. Okay? <coughs> so, dead load deflection. Okay? Here's the moment. Let me zoom in a little bit. The moment, WL squared over 8, no load factors, 135 foot kips. Your effective moment of inertia, again, it's got to be between that 19,600 and 12,000. 5 WL to the fourth over 384 EI. Again, consistent units, okay? You should get about 0.45 inches. That's your dead load deflection, <coughs> all right? Dead plus live, your moment. WL squared over 8 plus PL over 4. I had folks trying to turn the point load into a distributed load. You were given the beam aids on the next page, so you should have had all of that. <coughs> so WL squared over 8 plus PL over 4, you got 360. Compute a new moment of inertia right here. What is your deflection? Use that moment of inertia, 5WL to the 4th over 384EI plus PL cubed over 48EI. All right? Using this moment of inertia, plug and chug, you get 1.019. <coughs> so that's your dead plus your live. Here's your live load instantaneous deflection. Okay? All right? Long term, dead load deflection, live load deflection, no sustained load deflection. None of the live load is sustained. Your reinforcement ratio. I still had folks saying this was zero. It's not. You have compression steel. Area of steel or of compressive steel divided by BD. There's your uh, row prime. Calculate your multiplier for you only need it for dead load, so it's two divided by one plus fifty row prime. There we go. Total deflection is this. <coughs> Compare that against your limits, and you're good. Live load deflection compared against L over 360, total deflection compared against L over 240. Are there any questions? Again, if you choose not to uh, do your corrections, your grade stands. It's totally your choice. I mean, if the high on the exam was a 93, if you got a 93, you don't feel like doing it. I mean, a 93 at the very best becomes a 96.5 or whatever. So is it worth all the effort to do the exam all over again for three and a half points? Okay. Or, I mean, your choice. Your choice. <coughs> All right. 
but yeah, I mean, I, I mean, there there were there were parts on the exam that went really well for everybody, but there was some stuff I was I was a little surprised at. So, I mean, before I end this, do you all have any questions about deflections, about the exam, about any of this? Because I, I I want you all to learn this, and I, I was a little surprised. What? Everybody good? Okay, all right. <coughs> so, a couple of things. Uh, number one, you need a copy of the exam. So, All right. In the meantime, I have a couple of things I need to hand back to you all. So I have owed you all homework six for a while. Um, homework six is your deflection homework. You all had the solution before the exam. So I have it graded. I'm not going to go over that because you all have the solution, so you're going to know what you did right or what you did wrong. Um, there was that question on the I effective for the second problem, so I just benefited the benefit of the doubted that problem. So <coughs> average grades on this homework were pretty high. Okay, let's see. So there's that. There's that. Now, let's talk a little bit about housekeeping for the end of the semester. So you all have turned in homework number seven, right, which is your development length homework. <coughs> this is your last homework in this class, homework number eight, which is on columns and beam columns. Um, we're going to go over some of this today. Uh, give me one moment. Is it not written? I'm sorry. And development link. All right. Okay, so does everybody have, let's see, homework six, their exam, a corrections assignment, and homework number eight. Does everybody have that? All right. Corrections due Monday on the dot. Okay. Now, a couple more things in terms of bookkeeping. Goodness. So, on Friday of next week, your column assignment is due. I will give you the solution the day, that day. 
So you will have it for, for review for the final. Okay? <coughs> In the meantime, your grades, everything has been posted to MU online, so everything should be up to date. As soon as I leave class, I'm going to turn everything on so that your exam grade is visible. And then I've also created a column called class average. And what it's doing is it's computing your class average, assuming that there is no exam three, and it's taking your average in this class as it stands right now. Okay? <coughs> that class average will obviously change if you, you know, you know, as uh, with homework eight, your corrections, and then the final exam. But that'll at least give you an idea as to where you stand right now. Okay? Sound good? All right. Before I get into columns, did everybody get a handout on compression members? I've got three or four, so somebody didn't. Okay. Um, one final thing, um, in terms of uh, the handouts for the semester, probably either, I'm thinking Monday of next week, I'm going to come in with the notebook, give one final pass, make sure everybody has everything, okay? So I would be here. <laughs> um, <coughs> all right. Sound good? All right. Let's actually get back to the wonderful world of columns. <coughs> Man, we've gotten through a lot of material this semester. The final's on all of that. That was a joke. I heard it that time. <laughs> okay. So real quick, let me quickly recap columns and what have you. Um, I think you're going to find that at least axially loaded columns are pretty simple. <coughs> um, so again, we're going to cover two types of columns in this class. Uh, members subjected to purely axial load and then axial load plus bending. Um, <coughs> we're not going to consider the effects of buckling for what we do in here, so we're basically just going to limit our compressive stress in the concrete to 0.85 FC prime. <coughs> we will deal with different types of columns, particularly uh, rectangular or grid reinforced type columns, and then spirally reinforced columns, aka uh, circular columns, they perform a little better because they have better confinement. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. To, uh, to compute the, uh, the capacity of a column, all you do is you take the nominal th or the theoretical capacity, if you will, adjust it to account for accidental eccentricity, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, com conceptual questions and all that jazz, and then phi pn. <coughs> now, Spiral columns, as we said, perform a little better. So your adjustment constants, your, your strength reduction factor, your fee value, and your uh, 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 eccentricity factor, they're a little higher because they reduce that capacity less because spirally reinforced columns perform better. <coughs> now, um, a couple things on detailing. Column, I mean, this, it's not anything technically challenging. As you're going to see here in this example, it's probably going to get a little boring looking at all these limits for columns, but it's just one of the thing <coughs> sorry, one of those things you got to do. So uh, ACI 318 lists the following requirements for cast in place columns. <coughs> Your uh, longitudinal reinforcing steel has got to be somewhere between 1% or 8%. That's your reinforcement ratio, your gross reinforcement ratio. If you're looking at <coughs> Rectangular columns, you have to have at least four bars. If you're looking at spirally reinforced columns, you got to have at least six bars. And a practical, practical minimum dimension is anywhere between eight and ten inches. Twelve inches is pretty common. 
Excuse me. So some additional requirements for cast in place tie columns. Um, your minimum tie size is either a number three or a number four, depending on how big your longitudinal bars are. Your minimum tie spacing is either an inch or the longitudinal bar diameter. Your maximum tie spacing is the smallest, a 48 bar diameter, 16 longitudinal, uh, or 14 tie bar or 48 tie bar diameters, bleh, 16 longitudinal bar diameters, or the least column dimension. <coughs> and honestly, you end up detailing most of the time based off your maximum spacing, not your minimum. <coughs> that longitudinal bar inside the column can't be uh, uh, more than six inches away from the next one. Um, <coughs> for spiral columns, you got to have uh, spirals that are number threes or larger, and that spacing tends to be pretty tight. All right, so we're going to look at this column analysis uh, right here, it's pretty straightforward. Um, let me go forward a little bit to sort of explain. So what we're going to do is we're going to do two analysis problems. We're going to do a rectangular column analysis and check its detailing. Then we're going to look at some additional requirements for spiral columns and do an analysis of that. <coughs> so let's look at the design or try and find the design strength of this uh, column that you see here. It's reinforced by eight number nine bars going in this direction, column 16 by 16. The ties are number three bars spaced at 16 inches along the column <coughs> and what have you. All right, sound good? So, You look like you have a question. Those are the ties. Yeah, so basically what you've got is, um, oh, goodness. No. Well, yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, I wanted to draw it out, but that actually worked out pretty, pretty perfectly. So the number threes and 16 are these horizontal bars going up the column. Yes. They're number threes wrapped around, and they're every 16 inches. All right, make sense? All right. Goodness. No, 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 we said one and a half. Oh, one and a half? Okay. Yeah. <coughs> one and a half for interior applications and no, like, de-icing salts and things like that. But, I mean, it, it's not like it's anything difficult to detail. It's just, it's a lookup. So, I believe there's a table, like, early on in your textbook that goes through that. All right, so real quick, all right, excuse me, <coughs> all right, so FC prime for this column is 4 KSI and FY is 60 KSI. <coughs> Goodness, my allergies. Um, now, the dimensions of this column are square, right? They're 16 inches. And then what about the area of the reinforcement? We have eight number nines, so what is the area? Eight, no, eight, no, eight, eight square inches. Units. He was testing me, my goodness. <coughs> Wonder what would happen if I turn the comments on for, for these videos. I, I can't do that. I get random comments from 
everywhere. I made them unlisted. And it doesn't do that automatically. I have to go in and do that after the class. For a short time, they're public. And I've gotten comments in the interim. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. Well, that, that's a popular playlist. I'll give you that. No, 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 no. No, no. I, I don't believe in that. Goodness gracious. Ever the capitalists in this room, right? <laughs> it's all about the safety of the public is what it should be about. That's what you meant. All right, back to columns. Goodness. <coughs> all right, so the, or the, computation, bleh, computation, the computation of the design capacity is actually pretty short for this short column. All right, we are dealing with a rectangular square, or a you know, rectangular square, but a tied column. So what is phi and alpha? Excuse me. Alpha accounts for the fact that you have unintended eccentricity. Go back a page. Yep. Good. No, okay, all right. For what we're doing, no, because for now we're neglecting buckling. We might get to it if we have time, but what I'll say is this. A lot of the buckling provisions are very similar to what we did in steel design. Alignment charts, K factors, it's very similar. So, in fact, it's arguably simpler. So, bless you. All right, sound good? So, to compute the capacity, it's pretty simple. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. So, Pretty straightforward, right? So phi is 0 0.65, 0 0.8, 0 0.85, 4 KSI. Now, what is the gross area of this column? Say it again. 136, what is 60, so 256 maybe? You went to an engineering class and you didn't bring a calculator. I'm getting ahead of myself. 256. So again, <coughs> remember the idea is we calculate 0.85 FC prime times the area of the concrete. The area of the concrete is not 16 times 16. It's 16 times 16 minus the steel in there because the column is 16 by 16, but 8 square inches of that is taken up by a rebar. So we subtract that out. 
All right, what do we got? I, 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 no. No, no. Again, though, if you did, I mean, they're like, open up, I think it's like chapter 11 on slender columns, and you're going to see stuff that's very similar to what we did in steel design. <coughs> what do we get? Like point one? Okay, what? 688.1 what? Kips. Look at all of your units. You're taking KSI times inches squared. Plus, it's a column. We're taking that column, figuring out how much we can before it you know, crushes. So, that should be in kips. <coughs> Goodness, dropping stuff. So, technically, this is your answer. And that's it. But, since I want to be detailed with this problem, I am going to do some uh, uh, detailing checks. <coughs> and I'm going to walk you through this. It's going to be simple. All right. <coughs> All right, detailing checks. Okay. Let's start off with the steel percentage. Let's test your memory banks. It's got to be between what two values? The percentage of steel. There we go. Um, I'll say, let me erase that and say steel percentage. All right. <coughs> so, how do we calculate that? It's the area of steel divided by the area of concrete. So that is 8 square inches divided by 256. And what is that? Uh, well, yeah, yeah, uh, technically I guess you could if you wanted to get technical, you know, with that, but we're just considering full gross area of the column here. <coughs> it, say it again. There we go. It's more about uh, it's more about how much steel is there in the column altogether. Is that good? There we go. <coughs> All right. How many bars are there in the, in the uh, eight? So I'll say number of bars. Is that good? What's the requirement? How many bars must we have? Four, right? So that's good. All right. <coughs> What's next? What's the minimum tie size? I mean, that, that's one of the things about the handouts. Like, it, they're literally sequentially going through all this. So what is the, the minimum tie size for this, this column? What's that? Not the spacing, the size. A number three. Why is it a number three? The bars are number nine, so it's a number three. Are we good here? Yep. <coughs> All right. Now, what about minimum tie spacing? What's that going to be? What is the diameter of a number nine? No. Units. One point one two eight. You look it up. 
<clears throat> Where's your book? Where's your notes that has the table in it? <sighs> somebody's somebody's being a, a pirate with their their PDFs, right? You lost your concrete stick? No, it's too perfect. Oh. What are you rusting? Oh, <coughs> no, I don't rust it. I don't get it. Man. This is, man. This is just involved, way involved. And people watching the video are like, what are they talking about? <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> That's why the comments need to be enabled. I'm just having a conversation with myself. I figure people would, you know, I figure people would would pick up when I just randomly say "bless you" that somebody sneezed in class. So I have I like enchanted the videos or something. <laughs> Like an like what is it like the, the the interactive like Harry Potter type thing? You walk past the hall and you sneeze and one of the paintings goes bless you. You know. <laughs> Hit that subscribe button. All right. <laughs> I know things. Um. <coughs> All right. Um. Let me move this over here. Uh. <coughs> maximum tie spacing. We have three criteria, right? 48 uh, tie diameters, right? What's the diameter of a number three? That's the area. Units. A number three. Hold on now, you construction materials folks. Number three to number eight, what's the diameter? Hey, we're, there we go. <coughs> so 48 times three eighths, that's 18 inches. 16 or longitudinal. Now what's the diameter of a number nine? There we get 1.128 which is like 18.05. or the least column dimension. What are the dimensions of the column? 16 by 16, right? Or, <coughs> right? So, the maximum tie spacing is the minimum one of all of these, which is going to be that one. Are we good? <coughs> what is the tie spacing? 16 inches. Or, I'll put OK. that means you need more ties. Like if it, if I had that the ties were number three at let's say 20 inches, you'd be able to compute the, co uh, the column capacity but then say you need more ties. Honestly that's what that means. You just need more of them. Sound good?
Well, column capacity is not a function of your tie spacing. Yes. Basically, you are computing column capacity assuming you have adequate tie spacing. The answer is you just you throw more of them in there. <coughs> all right. Last thing I'm going to show you, all right? Everybody got this? All right. <coughs> now watch this. Clear bar spacing has to be less than or equal to what? Six inches. So watch what I'm going to do. How many spaces are there? There's three bars, right, longitudinally. So <coughs> I'm here, let me show you something. I'm going to compute the capacity of the space between here and here, the clear space. So watch this. Column is 16 inches, right? So I'm going to come in an inch and a half on either side. I'm going to come in 3 eighths on either side to account for the number 3. Then I'm going to take out three number 9's and that's going to leave me that total clear space. Cut that dimension in half, and I get that. Does that make sense? All right. <coughs> so I would have 16 inches minus two covers minus two ties. What's the diameter of a number three? Three eighths. Subtract three bars which is and then divide that by two. <coughs> that would give me the clear space between an individual two bar or between two bars. And what is that? Are we good? You tell me. What's that got to be less than? Six inches. All right. Does that make sense? No, better. All right. It doesn't? What, what's up with it? All right, look, real quick, real quick. All right, watch this. Here's, bless you. Here's the column, right? Okay, hold on. Okay, so here's, your tie, right? All right, now here's what I'm doing. I'm subtracting one, two, three. All right, so if I have 16 inches and I subtract this out and this out, I subtract that out and that out, and I subtract that, that, and that, I'm left with literally this total length from here to here plus here to here. I cut that in half so that all, all I'm getting is one of them. The top, uh, the, the top. <laughs> then I subtract out three bars and that gives me that total clear space. Like, let's put it like this. If I had four bars, I would subtract four of these, but then I'd divide the whole thing by three. Does that make sense? All right, make sense? Yep. All right. All right, that's all I got for you all. See you all on Friday.